I was a few miles into the deep woods, with nothing but the sounds of nature to accompany me. The forest was dense, almost untouched by civilization, and the thick canopy above allowed only specks of sunlight to filter through. I had my rifle slung over my shoulder and a thermos of coffee in my pack. Hunting had always been my escape, my way to disconnect from the chaos of daily life. My name is Daryl Finch. I'm not what you'd call an optimist, but I've seen my fair share of hard times. Grew up in a rough neighborhood, lost my dad young, and had to fend for myself from an early age. Hunting was something I picked up to put food on the table, but it became more than that. It was therapeutic, a chance to be alone with my thoughts. The forest in Colorado was known for its challenging terrain and abundant wildlife. I'd been here many times before, but this time felt different. There was an eerie silence that didn't sit right with me. The birds weren't singing, and even the wind seemed to avoid the trees. I shrugged it off, thinking maybe I was just overthinking things. About midday, I stumbled upon a clearing with a small creek running through it. Perfect spot to take a break and maybe set up camp for the night. I dropped my pack, sat on a fallen log, and poured myself a cup of coffee. As I sipped the hot liquid, I noticed something odd on the other side of the creek. An abandoned campsite. There were remnants of a fire pit, a few torn tents, and what looked like personal belongings scattered around. Curiosity got the better of me. I crossed the creek and started inspecting the site. It was clear that whoever had been here left in a hurry. Pots and pans were overturned, clothes were strewn about, and the whole place had a sense of desperation. That's when I saw it, a smear of blood on one of the tent flaps. It wasn't much, but enough to make my stomach churn. I radioed in to my buddy Jack, who worked with the local forest service. Hey Jack, you there? Yeah, Daryl, what's up? I'm out in the woods, about six miles north of the main trail. Found an abandoned campsite. Looks like someone left in a rush. Might be worth checking out. Roger that. You find any ID or anything? Not yet. Just some blood and a lot of scattered gear. All right. Stay put and stay safe. I'll send someone out. I continued searching the campsite. There were no IDs, no clues as to who these people were. Just when I was about to give up, I heard a rustle in the bushes behind me. I spun around, rifle at the ready, but saw nothing. Just the wind, I thought. But my instincts told me otherwise. That's when I noticed the footprints. Large, clawed prints that didn't belong to any animal I'd ever seen. They led away from the camp and into the deeper part of the forest. Against my better judgment, I decided to follow them. I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible had happened, and if there was a chance someone was hurt, I needed to find them. The tracks led me through dense underbrush and rocky terrain. The forest grew darker, the air colder. I checked my watch, 3 p.m. Still plenty of daylight left, but the shadows were lengthening. After about an hour of hiking, I came across a small cave entrance. The prints led straight inside. I hesitated. Going into a dark cave in the middle of nowhere wasn't exactly high on my list of smart decisions. But I couldn't turn back now. I grabbed my flashlight from my pack, checked my rifle, and stepped into the cave. The air inside was damp and musty. The beam of my flashlight cut through the darkness, revealing rough walls and the occasional bat hanging from the ceiling. The footprints were still visible in the dirt, leading deeper into the cave. I followed them cautiously, every step echoing in the confined space. That's when I heard it. A faint almost imperceptible sound. It was a low, raspy breathing, like something was struggling to stay quiet. I tightened my grip on the rifle and moved forward, my heart pounding in my chest. As I rounded a corner, the cave opened up into a larger chamber. And there, in the dim light of my flashlight, I saw it. A creature, hunched over, gnawing on what looked like a deer carcass. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, Tall, with sinewy limbs and a grotesque, twisted face. Its skin was pale, almost translucent, and its eyes... Its eyes were dark and empty, devoid of any emotion or life. I froze, my mind racing. What the hell was this thing? The creature sensed my presence and slowly turned its head towards me. 
For a moment, we just stared at each other. Then it let out a guttural snarl and charged. Instinct kicked in. I fired a shot, hitting it in the shoulder, but it barely flinched. The creature was fast, faster than anything that size had a right to be. It closed the distance in seconds, knocking me to the ground. My rifle flew out of my hands, and I was left struggling against its immense strength. I reached for my hunting knife, slashing wildly. The blade connected, and the creature recoiled, giving me a moment to scramble to my feet. I grabbed the rifle and fired again, this time aiming for its head. The shot echoed in the cave, and the creature fell back, its body convulsing. For a moment I thought it was over, but the creature wasn't dead. It got up slowly, snarling, blood dripping from its wounds. I fired again and again until the rifle clicked empty. The creature finally collapsed, motionless. I stood there panting, trying to catch my breath. My hands were shaking, my heart racing. I had no idea what I had just encountered, but one thing was clear. I needed to get out of there. I made my way back out of the cave, the daylight almost blinding after the darkness inside. I retraced my steps to the abandoned campsite, my mind still reeling. I radioed Jack again, giving him a brief update. Jack, it's Daryl. You're not going to believe this, but I found something. Some kind of creature. It attacked me, but I managed to take it down. I'm heading back now. Jesus, Daryl. You all right? Yeah. Just a bit shaken. I'll be back soon. The walk back to my truck was a blur. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I had seen. As I reached the clearing where I had parked, I noticed something else. Another set of footprints, leading away from the truck. They were similar to the ones I had followed earlier, but fresher. I knew I should leave, get the hell out of there. But something compelled me to follow them. Maybe it was curiosity, or maybe I just needed answers. I followed the tracks, my rifle ready. The tracks led me to another part of the forest, to a small, secluded cabin I had never seen before. The windows were boarded up, and the door hung loosely on its hinges. I approached cautiously, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. As I reached the door, I heard a noise from inside. A faint whimper, like someone was hurt. I pushed the door open and stepped inside, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The interior was a mess, with broken furniture and old newspapers scattered everywhere. Then I saw them. A group of people huddled in the corner, tied up and gagged. Their eyes widened with fear as they saw me. I quickly untied them, and they started to sob and thank me. What happened here? I asked, trying to make sense of the situation. One of them, a young woman with tear-streaked cheeks, managed to speak. We were camping. Something attacked us. It killed my friends and dragged us here. I felt a chill run down my spine. The creature I had killed wasn't alone. There were more of them out there. I helped the group back to my truck, my mind racing. We needed to get out of the forest and get help. As we drove back towards civilization, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We reached the ranger station just as the sun was setting. Jack was there, along with a few other rangers. I gave them a brief rundown of what had happened, and they took the survivors inside to get medical attention. Daryl, what the hell is going on out there? Jack asked, his face pale. I don't know, Jack, but there's something in those woods. Something dangerous. We'll send a team out to investigate. In the meantime, you should get some rest. I nodded, but I knew sleep wouldn't come easy. As I drove home, my mind replayed the events of the day. The creature, the abandoned campsite, the people I had rescued. It all seemed like a nightmare. As I pulled into my driveway, I saw something that made my blood run cold. Another set of footprints, leading from the woods to my front door. I grabbed my rifle, my heart pounding. I stepped out of the truck, my eyes scanning the darkness. The footprints were fresh, and they led straight to my door. I approached cautiously, my flashlight cutting through the night. As I reached the porch, I heard it again, that faint, raspy breathing. I spun around, my rifle ready, but saw nothing. Just the wind, I thought, but my instincts told me otherwise. I opened the door and stepped inside, 
locking it behind me. I checked every room, but there was no sign of anything unusual. Still, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I decided to stay up, keeping my rifle close. I knew I couldn't let my guard down, not with those creatures out there. As the hours passed, I kept a vigil, my mind racing with thoughts of what I had encountered. When dawn finally broke, I felt a sense of relief. The daylight brought a semblance of safety, but I knew it was temporary. Those creatures were still out there, and I had no idea how many there were. I reported back to the ranger station, where Jack was waiting. Any updates? I asked. We sent a team out to the cave and the cabin. They found the creature you killed, and they're analyzing it now. But there's something else. We found more footprints, leading deeper into the forest. I nodded, my suspicions confirmed. We need to be prepared, Jack. There's more of them out there, and they're not going to stop. We're setting up a perimeter and bringing in more personnel. We'll find them. I knew it wouldn't be that easy. These creatures were smart, and they had the advantage of knowing the terrain. But I wasn't going to sit back and wait for them to come to me. Over the next few days, we worked tirelessly, setting traps and patrolling the forest. The tension was palpable, everyone on edge, knowing that at any moment, we could be attacked. Then, on the fifth day, it happened. We were patrolling near the cave when we heard a blood-curdling scream. We rushed to the source only to find one of our rangers torn apart, his body mangled beyond recognition. The creature was there, standing over him. It was different from the one I had killed. Smaller, but just as vicious. It turned its head towards us and let out a deafening roar. We opened fire, the shots echoing through the forest. The creature charged, but we managed to bring it down. As it lay there, motionless, I couldn't help but wonder how many more there were. We continued our patrols, but the sightings became less frequent. It seemed like we had driven them back, at least for now. But I knew it was only a matter of time before they returned. The forest was no longer a place of solace for me. It had become a battleground, a constant reminder of the horrors that lurked within. But I wasn't going to let fear control me. As I packed up my gear and prepared to leave, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. The creatures were still out there, waiting for the right moment to strike. And when they did, I would be ready. The old backwoods of Maine have always been my sanctuary. The dense forest with its labyrinth of trees and the symphony of chirping birds and rustling leaves offered a perfect escape from the grind. I grew up here, with my father teaching me the art of hunting, tracking, and surviving. It was a place where time stood still, and the world outside ceased to matter. My name is Landon Whitaker, a name passed down through generations each bearer having a story etched into the annals of this forest. I've seen the best and worst of nature, but nothing prepared me for what unfolded that fateful day. I decided to venture out on a hunting trip, hoping to clear my mind and connect with the land as my ancestors did. I set off early in the morning, the air crisp and filled with the scent of pine and earth. The forest was alive with the sounds of wildlife, and the promise of a good hunt filled me with anticipation. My rifle slung over my shoulder, I trekked deeper into the woods, far from the beaten path where the trees grew thicker and the underbrush became a tangled mess. As the day wore on, I noticed something unusual. The forest, which had been bustling with activity, grew eerily silent. The birds ceased their singing, and even the wind seemed to hold its breath. It was as if the entire woods had entered a state of suspended animation. I pressed on, my senses on high alert, every snap of a twig and rustle of leaves making my heart race. I reached a clearing I'd never seen before. It was strange, considering I knew these woods like the back of my hand. The clearing was circular, the trees around it appearing almost manicured, as if someone had purposefully shaped them. In the center lay a large, moss-covered boulder with peculiar markings etched into its surface. The symbols were foreign, 
unlike anything I'd encountered. Curiosity got the better of me. I approached the boulder, tracing the markings with my fingers. They were cold to the touch, sending a shiver down my spine. As I examined the symbols, a rustling from the bushes on the other side of the clearing caught my attention. I whipped around, rifle at the ready, eyes scanning the dense foliage. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the bushes. At first I thought it was a bear, but it was unlike any animal I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, its body covered in coarse, matted fur, muscles rippling beneath the surface. Its face was a grotesque blend of human and beast, with elongated features and a mouth filled with sharp, jagged teeth. The eyes, though, were the most unsettling part. They seemed almost human, filled with a sinister intelligence. The creature let out a guttural snarl, a sound that resonated deep within my bones. I raised my rifle, aiming for its head. I squeezed the trigger, but the creature moved with a speed that defied logic, evading the bullet with ease. It lunged at me, its claws swiping through the air. I barely managed to dodge, feeling the wind of its strike graze my cheek. I fired again, this time aiming for its torso. The bullet hit its mark, but the creature barely flinched. It was as if my shots were nothing more than mosquito bites. Panic set in as I realized my rifle was useless against this monstrosity. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my chest, the creature's footsteps thundering behind me. The forest became a blur as I sprinted through the trees, my lungs burning and my legs screaming in protest. I could hear the creature closing in, its breath hot on my neck. Desperation fueled my escape, and I stumbled upon a narrow ravine. Without thinking, I leaped across, barely making it to the other side. The creature skidded to a halt, unable to follow, its furious roar echoing through the forest. I didn't stop running until I reached the edge of the woods, collapsing in a heap, gasping for breath. My mind was a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. What the hell was that thing? I knew I couldn't stay out here, not with that creature on the loose. I had to warn the others, to make sure no one else ventured into these cursed woods. I made my way back to the small cabin I called home. It was an old, weathered structure, built by my grandfather and passed down through the generations. It offered a semblance of safety, but the fear gnawed at me. I locked the doors and windows, grabbing every weapon I had, from hunting knives to my father's old shotgun. As night fell, the forest outside grew even more sinister. The usual sounds of nocturnal creatures were absent, replaced by an oppressive silence. I sat in the dimly lit living room, my eyes darting to every shadow, every creak of the wooden floorboards making my pulse quicken. Suddenly, a loud thud echoed from the roof. I froze, my grip tightening on the shotgun. Another thud, followed by the sound of scraping claws. The creature was here, hunting me. I moved slowly, trying to keep my breathing steady, inching towards the back door. I knew I couldn't stay inside. It was only a matter of time before the creature found a way in. I slipped out the back door, making my way to the old barn. It was a sturdy structure, reinforced with metal beams and thick wooden planks. It might offer some protection, at least for a while. I barricaded myself inside, listening to the sounds of the creature prowling around the cabin, its frustration evident in its guttural snarls and the sound of splintering wood. Hours passed, each one feeling like an eternity. The creature eventually left, but I knew it was only a matter of time before it returned. I had to find a way to kill it, to end this nightmare once and for all. I spent the next day preparing, fashioning crude traps and gathering supplies. I knew the woods better than anyone, and I would use that knowledge to my advantage. I ventured back into the forest, setting my traps and carefully planning my strategy. The creature was fast and powerful, but it wasn't invincible. I just needed to be smarter, to outwit it. As night fell, I positioned myself in a tree stand, my rifle loaded with silver bullets I'd found among my grandfather's old hunting gear. He'd always been a superstitious man, believing in legends and folklore. I hoped those beliefs would save me now. The forest was eerily quiet once more, the darkness pressing in around me. I waited, my senses on high alert, every muscle tensed. Hours passed, and just when I thought the creature might not show, I heard it. The sound of heavy footsteps, the snapping of twigs, and the low growl of the beast. It appeared in the clearing below, sniffing the air, 
its eyes scanning the trees. It was hunting me, but it had no idea I was already hunting it. I took a deep breath, steadying my aim, and fired. The silver bullet hit the creature in the chest and it let out a howl of pain, staggering back. I fired again, this time aiming for its head. The bullet struck true and the creature collapsed to the ground, its body convulsing. I climbed down from the tree stand, approaching cautiously, my rifle trained on the beast. It lay still, its chest rising and falling shallowly. I aimed for its heart and fired one last time. The creature let out a final, shuddering breath, and then it was still. I stood there, my heart pounding, my body trembling with adrenaline and exhaustion. It was over. The nightmare was finally over. I returned to the cabin, my mind a whirlwind of emotions. Relief, exhaustion, and a lingering sense of disbelief. I couldn't explain what had happened, couldn't comprehend the existence of such a creature. But one thing was certain. The forest would never be the same for me. I gathered my belongings, packing up everything I could carry. I couldn't stay here, not after what I'd seen. I needed to get away, to find somewhere safe. As I left the cabin, I took one last look at the woods, a place that had been my sanctuary and now held nothing but fear. I didn't know where I would go or what I would do, but I knew one thing for sure. I would never forget the terror that lurked in those woods, the creature that had haunted my every step. And I would carry the memory of that day with me, a reminder of the darkness that exists just beyond the edge of the light. As I drove away, the forest fading into the distance, I felt a strange mix of emotions. Relief at having survived, sadness for the loss of my sanctuary, and a lingering sense of dread. But I was alive, and that was all that mattered. I would start over, find a new place to call home, and leave the horrors of the past behind. They always said that Devil's Hollow had a way of swallowing people up, and when I left the safety of my truck that morning, I should have known better. I was out hunting in the dense, overgrown forests of Devil's Hollow, a place notorious for its eerie atmosphere and the strange disappearances that happened there. The locals had their fair share of ghost stories and tales of supernatural creatures lurking in the woods, but I never paid much attention to them. I was just a regular guy, taking a break from the monotony of daily life, looking for some game. My name's Mitch Larkin. I've seen my share of weird things during my time, but nothing like what was waiting for me that day. I'd grown up in the nearby town of Ashton, a small, tight-knit community where everyone knew each other's business. When you're raised in a place like that, you develop a certain skepticism about the old legends and stories folks tell to keep kids from wandering too far into the woods. I'd heard it all from my grandfather, a tough old man who swore up and down that there were things out in the hollow that no man should ever encounter. It was a crisp morning, the kind where the air bites at your face and every breath feels like it's cutting through your lungs. The forest was quiet, unnaturally so, and that should have been my first clue that something was off. The only sound was the crunch of leaves under my boots and the distant chirping of birds. I had my rifle slung over my shoulder, more out of habit than necessity. In all the years I'd been hunting, I'd never had to use it for anything more than deer or the occasional wild boar. I'd been tracking a deer for about an hour when I first noticed the silence. It was as if the forest itself was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. I remember thinking that maybe it was just the early hour, that the forest hadn't fully woken up yet. But then I noticed something odd. There were no birds, no insects, nothing. Just an eerie, oppressive silence that seemed to press down on me from all sides. It wasn't long before I stumbled upon the first sign of trouble, a clearing in the trees, bathed in a strange, almost unnatural light. In the middle of the clearing, there was a pile of animal carcasses, all torn apart and strewn about like some grotesque art installation. I'd seen my share of dead animals, but this was different. The wounds were too clean, too precise, like they'd been made with a surgical instrument rather than the teeth or claws of a predator. 
As I stood there trying to make sense of what I was seeing, I heard a rustling in the bushes behind me. I spun around, my rifle at the ready, but there was nothing there. Just more silence. I took a deep breath and turned back to the clearing, only to find that the carcasses were gone. Vanished without a trace, as if they'd never been there in the first place. I was starting to feel a growing sense of unease, a gnawing fear that I couldn't quite shake. I decided it was time to head back to my truck, to get the hell out of those woods before things got any stranger. But as I made my way back through the trees, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was following me. I picked up my pace, my heart pounding in my chest. The forest seemed to close in around me, the trees twisting and contorting in ways that made no sense. It was like the woods themselves were alive, shifting and changing to keep me from finding my way out. I stumbled over roots and branches, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I fought to keep my panic at bay. And then I saw it, a figure standing in the shadows, just beyond the edge of my vision. It was tall, unnaturally so, with limbs that seemed to stretch on forever. Its skin was a sickly, mottled gray, and its eyes were empty, hollow pits that seemed to suck in the light around them. I froze, my rifle slipping from my grasp as I stared in horror at the thing before me. It moved with a fluid, almost serpentine grace, gliding through the trees with an otherworldly ease. I could hear a faint, almost inaudible whispering, like a thousand voices all speaking at once. The words were unintelligible, but the tone was unmistakable, malicious, malevolent, and filled with a hunger that sent a chill down my spine. I turned and ran, my heart pounding in my ears as I tore through the underbrush. I could hear the thing behind me, its whispers growing louder, more insistent. The forest seemed to twist and warp around me, the trees closing in to form a labyrinth of shadows and darkness. I stumbled and fell, my hands scraping against the rough bark of a tree as I scrambled to my feet. I knew I couldn't keep running forever. I had to find a way to lose it, to hide from it until I could figure out what to do. I spotted a small cave, half hidden by a tangle of vines and undergrowth, and made a desperate dash for it. I squeezed through the narrow opening, my heart pounding in my chest as I pressed myself against the cold, damp rock. The whispers were deafening now, filling my head with a cacophony of voices that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. I clamped my hands over my ears, trying to block out the sound, but it was no use. The thing was right outside the cave, its hollow eyes staring at me with an intensity that made my skin crawl. I don't know how long I stayed in that cave huddled in the darkness, waiting for the thing to leave. It felt like hours, but it could have been minutes for all I knew. Eventually, the whispers began to fade, the oppressive weight of its presence lifting as it moved away. I waited until I was sure it was gone before I dared to move. When I finally emerged from the cave, the forest was eerily quiet once more. I made my way back to my truck, my steps slow and deliberate, my senses on high alert for any sign of the creature. By the time I reached the safety of the open road, the sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows across the landscape. I didn't stop driving until I was back in Ashton, the familiar sights and sounds of the town a welcome relief after the horrors of Devil's Hollow. I knew I had to tell someone about what I'd seen, but who would believe me? I was just a hunter. A guy with no reason to make up stories about things that go bump in the night. Over the next few days, I tried to put the experience behind me, to convince myself that it had all been a bad dream. But the whispers haunted me, their malevolent tone a constant reminder of what I'd encountered. I knew I couldn't keep it to myself forever, that I had to warn others about the dangers lurking in those woods. So I went to the local sheriff, a no-nonsense man named Hank Waverly. He listened to my story with a skeptical expression, his eyes narrowing as I recounted the details of my encounter. When I was finished, he leaned back in his chair, his fingers tapping a steady rhythm on the desk. Mitch, you know how this sounds, right? He said finally. A creature in the woods, whispering voices, disappearing carcasses. It's a lot to take in. I know, Hank, I replied, my voice steady. But I'm telling you, there's something out there, something dangerous, 
You've got to warn people. Keep them away from Devil's Hollow. He sighed, rubbing a hand over his face. Look, I'll send a couple of deputies out there to check it out. But you know how these things go. If we don't find anything, there's not much we can do. I nodded, knowing that it was the best I could hope for. As I left the sheriff's office, I couldn't shake the feeling that I'd only scratched the surface of the horrors lurking in those woods. There were stories about people going missing, never to be seen again, and I wondered how many of them had encountered the same creature I had. A few days later, I heard that the deputies had gone out to Devil's Hollow, but they hadn't found anything unusual. No signs of the creature, no strange noises, nothing to suggest that my story was anything more than a figment of my imagination. But I knew better. I'd seen the thing with my own eyes, felt its malevolent presence, heard its whispers. I knew it was still out there, waiting. In the end, the only thing I could do was stay away from those woods, to warn others to do the same. The creature in Devil's Hollow was real, and it was dangerous. I'd had a close call, and I wasn't about to push my luck by going back. I could only hope that others would heed my warning, that they'd stay clear of the place and avoid the fate that so many before me had met. As for me, I kept hunting, but never again in Devil's Hollow. I stuck to safer, more familiar grounds, always keeping an eye out for anything unusual. The experience had changed me, made me more cautious, more aware of the dangers that could be lurking just out of sight. But it hadn't broken me. I was still Mitch Larkin, a hunter, a survivor, and I'd faced the darkness and lived to tell the tale. I always preferred the quiet solace of the woods to the hustle of town life. After the divorce, the tranquility of nature became a necessity for my sanity. My name's Clayton Everhart, and I'm a stubborn son of a gun from Arkansas. Hunting wasn't just a hobby. It was a way to connect with the world that didn't constantly demand something from me. On that particular morning, I decided to hunt near the Uachita Mountains. The dense woods there promised game, and most importantly, isolation. I parked my truck at the trailhead and trekked deeper into the forest, away from any well-trodden paths. The air was crisp, and the autumn leaves crunched beneath my boots as I walked, rifle slung over my shoulder. I'd been hiking for about an hour when I stumbled upon an old cabin. It looked like it hadn't been used in decades, half collapsed with vegetation growing through what remained of the roof. Curious, I decided to take a closer look. Inside, the remnants of a past life lingered. Rusted tools, a broken table, and a stack of yellowed newspapers dating back to the early 80s. As I sifted through the decaying relics, a peculiar feeling crept over me, like I was being watched. I shrugged it off as paranoia and exited the cabin, ready to get back to my hunt. But as I turned to leave, something caught my eye. A large, indistinct shape moving through the trees about a hundred yards away. Thinking it might be a deer, I lifted my rifle and peered through the scope. What I saw made my blood run cold. It wasn't a deer. It was something else. Something I couldn't immediately identify. It moved, with a strange fluidity, almost like it was gliding rather than walking. I froze, watching it disappear into the dense forest. Instinct told me to leave, but curiosity, and perhaps a bit of stubbornness, pushed me to follow. I moved cautiously, keeping my rifle ready. The deeper I ventured, the more signs of disturbance I noticed. Broken branches, scattered animal bones, and claw marks etched into tree trunks. After a while, I came across a clearing. In the center lay a grotesque sight. A mutilated deer carcass, torn apart as if by some massive predator. The air was thick with the stench of decay, and flies buzzed around the remains. My gut twisted, but I pressed on, my sense of unease growing with each step. Suddenly a guttural scream echoed through the trees, so raw and primal it made the hairs on my neck stand up. I whipped around, scanning the forest, but saw nothing. The scream came again, this time closer. I gripped my rifle tighter, feeling a cold sweat break out across my forehead. Then, without warning, it emerged from the underbrush. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen, 
standing over seven feet tall, covered in matted, dark fur, with limbs that seemed unnaturally long. Its face was a nightmarish blend of animalistic features and something almost human. It had eyes, but I dared not look into them. I didn't wait to find out what it wanted. I fired a shot, aiming for its chest. The bullet struck, but instead of falling, it roared and charged at me with terrifying speed. I turned and ran, heart pounding, weaving through the trees in a desperate bid to escape. The creature's footsteps thundered behind me, closing in. I stumbled into the old cabin, slamming the door shut and barring it with whatever debris I could find. The walls shook as the creature slammed against them, snarling in fury. I could see its shadow through the gaps in the wood, moving back and forth, searching for a way in. Time seemed to stretch endlessly as I waited, rifle at the ready. The creature's attacks grew more frantic, and I knew the flimsy door wouldn't hold much longer. I spotted an old hunting knife among the debris and grabbed it, preparing for a last stand. Just when I thought the door would splinter apart, the creature stopped. The forest fell silent. I held my breath, listening intently. Minutes passed, and there was no sound. Hesitantly, I peered through a crack in the wall. The creature was gone, leaving behind only a trail of destruction. I didn't waste any time. Gathering my things, I bolted from the cabin, running back towards my truck as fast as my legs would carry me. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves sent waves of terror through me, but I didn't stop, not until I reached the trailhead and saw the familiar sight of my old Chevy. I drove straight to the sheriff's office in Mina, rambling about the creature and the attack. Sheriff Roy Hastings, a grizzled veteran of the force, listened with a skeptical look on his face. He humored me enough to send a couple of deputies to check out the cabin, but I could tell he thought I was just another crazy hunter with a wild tail. A few hours later, the deputies returned with grim faces. They confirmed the carcass and the signs of a struggle, but found no trace of the creature. Sheriff Hastings advised me to lay low and avoid the area for a while, just in case. I spent the next few days holed up at home, jumping at every sound and replaying the encounter in my head. It wasn't until a local news report mentioned several missing hikers in the Ouachita Mountains that the gravity of my experience truly hit me. I wasn't the only one. Whatever that creature was, it was still out there, lurking in the woods. And it was hunting. Weeks passed, and life slowly returned to a semblance of normalcy. But the memory of that day lingered, a constant reminder of the unknown horrors that might still be out there, just beyond the edge of civilization. I took up hunting again, but I never ventured near the Oachita Mountains. The forest, once a place of solace, now felt like a haunted land, holding secrets that were better left undisturbed. I don't know what that creature was or where it came from, but I do know one thing for sure. I survived something that most people wouldn't believe. And while I've faced many challenges in my life, None have left a mark as deep or as chilling as that encounter in the woods. There's a scar on my left arm from where it slashed me, a permanent reminder of my brush with the unknown. I tell my story to those who will listen, not for the thrill of the tale, but as a warning. Nature hides many secrets, some better left untouched. In the years since, a few more people have gone missing in those woods, their disappearances shrouded in mystery. The local authorities attribute it to natural dangers, wild animals, treacherous terrain. But I know the truth. There's something else out there, something beyond our understanding. The woods around Sweetwater River have always been my escape from the suffocating monotony of city life. I often trekked there, a rifle slung over my shoulder, seeking solace in the rustle of leaves and the call of distant birds. I wasn't just a hunter of deer or quail. I hunted tranquility, a reprieve from the constant hum of urban chaos. My name is Thaddeus Kramer, but most folks just call me Thad. I don't have much to complain about, but everyone has their battles, right? Mine involved a messy divorce and a business partnership that went south faster than a goose in winter. Hunting was my way to keep it together. That particular morning, the sky was a canvas of oranges and pinks, a promising start. 
The air was crisp, carrying the earthy scent of damp leaves. I parked my truck at the edge of the forest and started my usual route, the path crunching under my boots. The sun filtered through the canopy, casting dappled shadows that danced with the wind. By noon, I'd covered a good stretch of ground. I sat on a fallen log, chewing on a sandwich and washing it down with coffee from my thermos. It was then that I heard it, a faint, distant scream. Not the kind you'd hear in the city, where people might be messing around. This was raw, primal, filled with terror. I froze, the sound gnawing at my curiosity and an instinctual dread. It took a moment to decide, but I couldn't just ignore it. Slinging my rifle back over my shoulder, I headed in the direction of the scream, my steps careful and deliberate. The woods grew denser, the light dimmer as I advanced. The scream echoed again, closer now, urging me onward. I stumbled upon an old cabin, one I hadn't seen in my many years of hunting these woods. It looked abandoned, the wood rotting and ivy snaking up the walls. The door was slightly ajar, creaking in the breeze. My gut told me to turn back, but the scream, now a desperate gurgling plea, pushed me forward. Inside the cabin was a mess of overturned furniture and scattered debris. The air was thick with the stench of decay. I crept through the main room, my rifle at the ready. A soft, almost imperceptible growl, no, not a growl, more like a low, wet breath, came from a corner shrouded in darkness. I moved closer, my heart pounding against my ribcage. As my eyes adjusted, I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I'd ever seen, was hunched over something. Its body was covered in matted fur, its limbs long and sinewy, ending in claws that looked capable of rending flesh from bone. It turned its head towards me, revealing a maw filled with jagged teeth, dripping with gore. The creature lunged, but I fired instinctively. The shot hit its shoulder, and it recoiled, a guttural screech filling the cabin. It darted past me, a blur of fur and fury, disappearing into the woods. I turned my attention to what it had been hunched over, a man, or what was left of him. His face was a mask of terror, his body a ruin of torn flesh and broken bones. I staggered back, the horror of it all crashing over me. I had to get out, had to find help. But as I stumbled outside, my foot caught on something, sending me sprawling. Looking down, I saw another body, partially buried under leaves and dirt. The realization hit me hard. This wasn't just an isolated attack. This creature had been hunting, feeding. I made it back to my truck my mind racing. I called the local sheriff, blurting out what I'd seen. To my relief, they took me seriously. Within the hour, the place was swarming with deputies and investigators. They found more bodies, each more gruesome than the last. As night fell, the woods took on an even more sinister air. The search teams were armed to the teeth, but there was an unspoken fear among us. We were hunting something beyond our understanding. The sheriff, a grizzled man named Elwood Barnes, approached me. Thad, you did the right thing calling us, he said, his voice steady but strained. But this, this is something else. We might be dealing with a predator we've never seen before. We set up camp near the cabin, taking turns keeping watch. The night was eerily quiet, every rustle and snap of a twig setting us on edge. Around midnight, the silence was shattered by another scream, followed by gunfire. The creature had struck again, taking one of the deputies before anyone could react. The rest of the night was a blur of fear and confusion. We managed to track the creature's movements, but it was always one step ahead, evading our traps and eluding our bullets. By dawn, we were exhausted, our nerves frayed. Sheriff Barnes called for reinforcements, but I knew deep down that more men and guns wouldn't be enough. This creature wasn't just an animal. It was something far more dangerous. Something that seemed to understand our tactics and counter them with ease. In the days that followed, the area was cordoned off and experts were brought in. They analyzed the tracks, the bodies, trying to make sense of it all. But the creature remained elusive, a phantom in the woods. People started calling it the Beast of Sweetwater, and the stories grew wilder with each retelling. 
Despite the fear and the horror, a part of me wanted to go back, to face the creature again. It wasn't just about survival anymore. It was about understanding, about confronting the unknown. But the rational part of me knew better. I had seen what it could do, and I knew that going back alone would be suicide. The media got hold of the story, turning Sweetwater into a circus of reporters and thrill-seekers. They didn't know the real danger, the terror that lurked just beyond the tree line. For them, it was a headline, a spooky tale to tell around the campfire. One evening, as I sat on my porch nursing a beer, I got a call from Barnes. They'd found something, a den filled with bones and remnants of its victims. But the creature itself was gone, vanished into the wilderness. We're pulling out, Thad, Barnes said. We've done all we can, but keep your eyes open and stay safe. As I hung up, I felt a mix of relief and unease. The immediate threat was over, but the beast was still out there, somewhere. And so were the questions. What was it? Where did it come from? And why did it kill? In the weeks that followed, life in Sweetwater returned to a semblance of normalcy. But for those of us who had seen the beast, who had witnessed the carnage, normal was a distant memory. We carried the scars, the memories of that day etched into our minds. I still go hunting, but I'm never alone. The woods, once a place of peace, now hold a different kind of mystery. My father used to tell me stories about the woods, claiming they were alive, always watching. Growing up, I figured it was just his way of keeping me cautious. Now, in the rural expanse of Idaho, I hunt more out of necessity than sport. I don't really know what made me go out on that specific day, but sometimes life pulls you by the guts into things you don't want. I'm Tobias Kensington, Toby for short, and hunting's been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. My family's been doing this for generations. The land is vast, filled with trees that whisper old secrets. My brother Caleb used to come with me, but he's been missing for three months now. Just vanished. People talk, but nobody knows anything. The early morning mist hung low over the ground, giving the forest an eerie, almost surreal quality. I parked my old pickup truck at the edge of the trail and grabbed my rifle. It's a Winchester 3006, reliable and lethal, with a scope for those long shots. Strapping on my gear, I moved quietly through the underbrush, keeping my eyes peeled for any sign of deer. About an hour into my trek, I noticed the forest was unusually quiet. No birds, no rustling leaves, just an oppressive silence. It was unnerving, but I pressed on. Maybe it was a bad omen, but I had a job to do. I was deep into the forest, far from any paths. The dense canopy above blocked out most of the light, making everything look dark and twisted. I crouched down, looking at some tracks in the dirt. They weren't deer tracks, that much was clear. They were larger, deeper, like something heavy had passed through. My heart rate picked up. I didn't want to admit it but there was a part of me that hoped it was Caleb. Maybe he had survived out here somehow. Ridiculous, I know. But when someone you care about goes missing, your mind clings to any scrap of hope. I followed the tracks for a while, keeping my steps light and my rifle ready. The deeper I went, the more the woods seemed to close in on me. The silence was suffocating. Then I saw it. A shadow moving between the trees just ahead. It was fast, too fast to be a human. I raised my rifle and scanned the area through the scope. Nothing. Just trees and shadows. I moved closer, every sense on high alert. Suddenly I heard a scream. A human scream. My blood ran cold. I took off running towards the sound, crashing through the underbrush. I burst into a small clearing and froze. The ground was soaked in blood. There were chunks of flesh, pieces of torn clothing, none of it recognizable. I fought the urge to vomit and forced myself to look closer. 
Among the scattered remains was a backpack. I recognized it immediately. It was Caleb's. My mind was reeling. How could this happen? What the hell was out here? I was so focused on the gruesome scene that I didn't notice the movement behind me until it was too late. Something heavy and powerful slammed into me, knocking me to the ground. My rifle skidded away, useless. I scrambled to my feet, adrenaline surging. There it was, standing at the edge of the clearing. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen, a hulking creature covered in matted fur with muscles rippling beneath. It had a face, vaguely human but distorted, with elongated jaws and teeth that looked more like fangs. I didn't have time to think. The creature lunged at me, and I dove to the side, barely avoiding its claws. I rolled to my feet and ran towards my rifle. The creature roared, a guttural, bone-chilling sound, and charged. I reached my rifle just in time, swung around, and fired. The shot hit the creature in the shoulder, and it let out a howl of pain. But it didn't stop. It came at me again, and I fired twice more, hitting it in the chest. It staggered, but still didn't go down. I had one shot left. I took aim and fired, hitting it square in the head. The creature collapsed, twitching and thrashing. I didn't wait to see if it would get up again. I turned and ran, tearing through the forest as fast as I could. My mind was a whirlwind of fear and disbelief. What the hell was that thing? And where was Caleb? I reached my truck and jumped in, slamming the door behind me. My hands were shaking as I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the engine to start. I drove like a madman, not stopping until I was back in town. I went straight to the sheriff's office. Sheriff Dalton was a tough old bastard, not the type to scare easily. But when I told him what I'd seen, even he looked shaken. You're sure it was Caleb's backpack? He asked, his voice grim. Positive, I replied. And there's something out there, something not human. We need to find Caleb if he's still alive. Sheriff Dalton nodded. We'll form a search party. But Toby, if what you're saying is true, we need to be careful. This thing sounds dangerous. I spent the next few hours organizing a search party with the sheriff. It wasn't easy convincing the townsfolk. Most of them thought I was either crazy or grief-stricken, imagining things. But a few of my friends, like Jack and Eileen, believed me and agreed to help. We headed back into the forest, armed to the teeth. The atmosphere was tense, every snap of a twig making us jumpy. We followed the tracks, retracing my steps from earlier. The closer we got to the clearing, the more palpable the fear became. When we arrived, the sight that greeted us was even worse than before. The creature was gone, but the blood and remains were still there. Sheriff Dalton looked around, his face grim. Spread out, he ordered. Look for any signs of Caleb or that thing. We searched for hours but found nothing. No more tracks, no sign of Caleb, and no sign of the creature. It was like it had vanished into thin air. As night fell, we had no choice but to head back. The woods were even more dangerous after dark. We were exhausted, defeated. But I wasn't ready to give up. Caleb was out there somewhere, and I was going to find him. Over the next few days, we continued searching, but it was like the forest itself was conspiring against us. We found more blood, more signs of struggle, but no bodies. It was as if the creature was toying with us, leaving just enough clues to keep us on edge. Then, one evening, I got a call from Jack. He sounded panicked, almost hysterical. Toby, you need to get over here. It's Eileen. She's missing. My heart sank. Eileen was one of the few who had believed me from the start. I grabbed my gear and headed to Jack's place. When I arrived, he was pacing back and forth, his face pale and drawn. She went out this morning, said she was going to check one of the old hunting cabins. She never came back. I found her rifle, but no sign of her. I knew we didn't have much time. If the creature had taken her, she might still be alive. We gathered a few more friends and headed back into the forest retracing Eileen's steps. The tension was palpable, everyone on edge. As we approached the cabin, we heard a noise, a low, moaning sound. We moved cautiously, weapons ready. Inside the cabin, we found Eileen. She was alive, but barely. Her clothes were torn, and she was covered in scratches and bruises. She looked up at us, her eyes wide with fear. It's out there, she whispered. It's hunting us. 
we carried Eileen back to town, where the doctor tended to her wounds. She was in shock, unable to give us any coherent details about what had happened. But her condition only reinforced the urgency of our situation. We regrouped at the sheriff's office, going over our options. Sheriff Dalton was adamant that we needed more firepower. He contacted the state authorities, requesting backup. They agreed to send a team, but it would take time for them to arrive. That night, we set up a perimeter around the town, armed and ready. We couldn't afford to let the creature get any closer. As the hours passed, the tension grew. Every rustle of the leaves, every distant sound made us jumpy. Then, just before dawn, we heard it. A series of guttural roars echoing through the forest. The sound was unlike anything we'd ever heard, primal and terrifying. We could hear the creature moving, crashing through the trees. We held our ground, weapons aimed at the darkness. The creature burst into the clearing, and we opened fire. Bullets tore into its flesh, but it kept coming, driven by a primal rage. It was a desperate, chaotic battle, but eventually, we brought it down. The creature lay still, its massive form sprawled across the ground. We approached cautiously, making sure it was truly dead. Up close, it was even more horrifying, its twisted features a grotesque blend of human and beast. As dawn broke, the state team arrived, taking over the scene. They examined the creature, trying to understand what it was and where it had come from. I stayed back, watching as they worked. I didn't need to know the details. I just needed to know that Caleb and the others had been avenged. In the days that followed, life in our small town slowly returned to normal. People whispered about the creature, speculating on its origins, but no one had any real answers. The forest, once a place of solace and familiarity, now felt tainted by the memories of that day. We buried the remains of those we'd lost, holding quiet, somber ceremonies. I stood by Caleb's grave, feeling a mix of sorrow and relief. He was gone but at least I had some closure. The forest had taken enough from us, and it was time to move on. As for me, I continued hunting, but I never ventured as deep into the woods again. The land was still vast, still filled with secrets, but I'd learned to respect its darker side. My father's stories had been right all along. The woods were alive, always watching, and sometimes they took what they wanted. But we'd fought back, and in that small victory, there was a sense of peace. We'd faced the unknown and survived, scarred but stronger for it. Life went on, and so did we, carrying the weight of our memories with us, but never letting them define us. It's funny how life works. You think you know your place in the world, your role. But then something happens, something that changes everything. You adapt, you fight, and you survive. That's what makes us human, I guess. The ability to face the darkness and come out the other side still standing. And that's enough for me. Hunting has always been a way for me to escape life's pressures. A way to find solitude in nature's vast expanse. Growing up, I faced my share of hardships, my dad's early death, the struggle to keep our family farm afloat, and the everyday grind of making ends meet. But out here in the woods, it's different. It's peaceful, calming, and it gives me time to think. The morning began like any other hunting trip. I was out in the dense forests of western Montana, a place where civilization felt a thousand miles away. The trees here are old, their thick trunks rising high above, creating a canopy that blocks out most of the sunlight. It's quiet, save for the occasional rustling of leaves or the distant call of a bird. The air was crisp, with the scent of pine and earth mingling in the breeze. I had my trusty rifle slung over my shoulder and a backpack with the essentials, water, some food, a first aid kit, and a knife. I was tracking deer, hoping to bring home something substantial. The forest was my sanctuary, a place where I could forget the world's troubles, at least for a while. As I moved deeper into the woods, the landscape began to change subtly. The trees grew denser, 
the underbrush thicker. I noticed something odd. The silence. Usually the forest was alive with sounds, but now it was eerily quiet. No birds, no rustling leaves, nothing. It was unsettling, but I shrugged it off. Nature had its quirks. Around midday, I stumbled upon an old, abandoned cabin. It looked like it had been there for decades, maybe longer. The wood was rotting, the roof caved in on one side and vines had started reclaiming it. I decided to take a break and check it out. Maybe I'd find something interesting or useful. Inside, the cabin was dark and smelled of damp and decay. Broken furniture lay scattered around, and an old, rusted stove sat in one corner. As I poked around, I found a trap door hidden beneath a pile of debris. Curiosity got the better of me, and I pried it open, revealing a set of stairs leading down into darkness. I grabbed my flashlight from my pack and descended the stairs cautiously. The air grew colder the deeper I went, and the walls were lined with strange symbols I couldn't decipher. It was unsettling, but I pressed on, my breath echoing in the confined space. At the bottom of the stairs I found a small room, barely larger than a closet. In the center was a wooden chest, its surface covered in dust and cobwebs. I opened it slowly, half expecting some kind of treasure. Instead, I found a collection of old yellowed papers and a few small trinkets, a pocket watch, a tarnished silver locket, and a weathered journal. I took the journal and started flipping through it. The handwriting was neat, but faded, and it detailed the life of a man named Edgar Ruggles, who had lived in the cabin during the late 1800s. He wrote about his life, his family, and the strange occurrences that had plagued him in the woods. Creatures he couldn't identify, noises in the night, and the feeling of being watched. As I read, I felt a chill run down my spine. The last entry was the most disturbing. Edgar described how something had come for him, a creature from the depths of the forest. He wrote of its immense size, its eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness, and its claws that could tear through flesh like paper. The entry ended abruptly with a final hastily scrawled sentence. It's here. I closed the journal, my mind racing. It had to be some kind of joke, a ghost story to scare off anyone who found it. But something about the writing felt genuine, like the ramblings of a man driven to the brink of madness. I decided it was time to leave. The woods didn't feel as inviting anymore, and the cabin seemed to close in around me. As I climbed back up the stairs, I heard a noise behind me, a faint shuffling sound. I spun around, but the room was empty. Just my imagination, I told myself. Back outside, the sun was beginning to set, casting long shadows through the trees. I started making my way back to my campsite, but the feeling of unease lingered. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves made me jumpy. I quickened my pace, eager to get out of the forest. As darkness fell, I realized I had strayed off my usual path. The forest seemed different, more menacing. I tried to retrace my steps, but nothing looked familiar. Panic started to set in. I was lost. I took a moment to collect myself and decided to head in what I thought was the direction of the cabin. At least I could spend the night there and figure things out in the morning. As I walked, I heard something moving in the trees behind me. I stopped, listening intently. The sound was getting closer, a soft, rhythmic crunching of leaves and twigs. I broke into a run, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't know what was out there, but I wasn't sticking around to find out. The trees blurred past me as I sprinted, my flashlight beam bouncing wildly. Suddenly I tripped over a root and went sprawling to the ground. My flashlight flew out of my hand and I scrambled to grab it. As I reached for it, I heard a low, guttural snarl behind me. I froze, my blood turning to ice. I slowly turned my head, and in the dim light, I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, with matted fur and a twisted, almost humanoid face. Its mouth was filled with rows of sharp teeth, and its claws looked like they could rip through steel. I scrambled to my feet and ran, not daring to look back. The creature let out a bone-chilling howl and gave chase. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush, gaining on me with every step. 
I burst into a small clearing and saw the cabin up ahead. I sprinted towards it, hoping it would offer some kind of protection. I reached the door and threw it open, slamming it shut behind me. I barricaded it with an old chair and backed away, my eyes locked on the door. The creature hit the door with a force that shook the entire cabin. The wood creaked and groaned, but it held. For now. I grabbed my rifle and aimed it at the door, my hands shaking. There was a moment of silence and then the door splintered as the creature burst through. I fired, the sound deafening in the confined space. The bullet hit the creature in the shoulder, but it barely flinched. It lunged at me, and I fired again, aiming for its head. This time the bullet found its mark, and the creature let out a pained roar. It staggered back, blood pouring from the wound. I took the opportunity to reload and fired a third shot, hitting it square in the chest. The creature collapsed to the floor, its body convulsing. I didn't wait to see if it was dead. I grabbed my pack and bolted out the door, running as fast as my legs would carry me. I didn't stop until I reached the edge of the forest, the lights of a small town visible in the distance. I stumbled into the town, out of breath and covered in dirt and blood. I must have looked like a madman, but I didn't care. I was alive. I found a payphone and called the local authorities, telling them everything that had happened. They arrived quickly, skeptical at first, but they followed me back to the cabin. When they saw the creature's body, their faces went pale. They took me back to the station, where I gave my statement. They promised to look into it, but I could tell they didn't know what to make of it. In the days that followed, the story spread like wildfire. Some people believed me, while others thought it was a hoax. The authorities cordoned off the area, claiming it was too dangerous for anyone to enter. I never went back to those woods. The memory of that night still haunts me, but I try not to dwell on it. Life goes on, and I have a family to take care of. I've been told I'm a bit too stubborn for my own good. Guess that comes from a lifetime of hunting. You spend enough time in the woods, you start thinking you know everything about it. I was out in the Black Hills of South Dakota, where I'd been tracking a big mule deer for a few days. The place was vast, rugged, and beautiful. Tall pines, rolling hills, and clear streams cutting through the landscape. You could get lost out here if you weren't careful. And sometimes, that's exactly what I wanted. My name's Clayton Delaney. I've been hunting these parts since I could hold a rifle. My dad taught me everything he knew, and I've been teaching myself ever since he passed. This trip was supposed to be a break from everything. Just me my old Winchester, and the wilderness. I had no idea it would turn into the kind of story you hear about on late-night radio shows. The day started off normal. Crisp air, a slight breeze, and the promise of good hunting. I'd set out before dawn, hoping to catch sight of the deer while it was still cool. By mid-morning, I was deep into the forest, moving quietly, every sense attuned to the surroundings. There's a rhythm to hunting, a connection to the land that makes you feel alive and part of something much bigger. As I moved through a dense thicket, I noticed something odd. The usual forest sounds had faded. No birds, no rustling leaves, just silence. It was eerie, but I shrugged it off. Animals get spooked for all kinds of reasons. Still, I kept my rifle at the ready, just in case. A few hours passed without much action. I found some tracks and followed them, but they led nowhere. Frustrated, I decided to take a break and set up a small camp near a stream. As I was unpacking, I heard a distant cry. It sounded human. I stood still, listening intently. Another cry. This one more desperate. Help! The voice was faint but unmistakable. I grabbed my rifle and headed towards the sound, my heart pounding. The cries grew louder as I approached a small clearing. There, lying in a pool of blood, was a man. He looked to be in his late thirties, dressed in hiking gear. His leg was mangled, flesh torn away in chunks. He was barely conscious, his face pale and eyes wide with fear. Jesus Christ, I muttered, dropping to my knees beside him. What the hell happened? Creature. He gasped, his voice weak. 
It attacked us. Please, help. Us? Where's the others? Gone. It took them. His eyes rolled back, and he passed out. I quickly assessed his wounds. They were bad. Too bad for me to handle out here. I needed to get him to a hospital, but we were miles from the nearest road. I pulled out my satellite phone and called for help, giving them my coordinates. It would take hours for anyone to reach us. In the meantime, I had to keep him alive. As I worked to stabilize him, I kept an eye on the surrounding woods. If there was something out there, it could come back. I found a sturdy branch and made a makeshift splint for his leg, then covered him with my jacket to keep him warm. The cries of the forest were returning, but they sounded different, distorted, almost like whispers. The sun was starting to set, casting long shadows across the clearing. I set up a small fire, hoping to keep any predators away. The man stirred and opened his eyes. Thank you, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Save your strength, I replied. Help's on the way. What's your name? He asked, his voice trembling. Clayton Delaney. You? David. David Harris. All right, David, just hang in there. He nodded weakly, and I could see the fear in his eyes. Whatever had attacked him was still out there, and it was only a matter of time before it returned. I stayed by his side, rifle in hand, scanning the darkness for any sign of movement. Night fell, and the forest came alive with sounds. Crickets chirped, owls hooted, and the wind rustled the leaves. But there was an undercurrent of something else, a feeling of being watched. Every snap of a twig made my heart race. I knew these woods, but they felt different now, hostile, like they were hiding something. Around midnight I heard it, a low, guttural noise that sent chills down my spine. It was unlike any animal I'd ever heard. I tightened my grip on the rifle, eyes straining to see through the darkness. The firelight cast eerie shadows, making it hard to distinguish shapes. Then I saw it. A hulking figure emerged from the trees, moving with an unnatural grace. It was tall, at least seven feet, with matted fur and long clawed hands. Its face was twisted, almost human, but with elongated features. It stopped at the edge of the clearing, staring at us with piercing eyes. Jesus, I whispered, taking aim. Stay back! The creature growled, a deep, resonant sound that shook me to the core. It took a step forward, and I fired. The shot rang out, echoing through the forest. The creature recoiled but didn't fall. Instead, it let out a roar of rage and charged. I fired again, hitting it in the chest, but it kept coming. David screamed, and I knew we were in deep trouble. The creature was on us in seconds, swiping at me with its claws. I barely dodged, feeling the air whoosh past my face. I fired a third shot, hitting it in the shoulder. This time it staggered, giving me a chance to grab David and pull him towards the fire. The creature hesitated, eyeing the flames with a mix of fear and anger. I took the opportunity to fire one last shot, aiming for its head. The bullet struck true and the creature let out a final, anguished cry before collapsing to the ground. I stood there, panting, adrenaline coursing through my veins. The forest was silent again, the only sound the crackling of the fire. David was unconscious, but alive. I checked the creature's body, making sure it was dead. Up close, it was even more horrifying. Its skin was mottled and scarred, with patches of fur missing. Its mouth was filled with sharp, jagged teeth. I backed away, feeling a mix of relief and horror. I'd never seen anything like it, and I hoped I never would again. As dawn broke, the sound of helicopters filled the air. Rescue teams arrived, and I waved them down. David was airlifted to the nearest hospital, and I stayed behind to explain what had happened. The authorities were skeptical at first, but the evidence was undeniable. The creature's body was taken away for study and I was left with more questions than answers. What was it? Where did it come from? I might never know. But one thing was certain. The Black Hills held secrets, and I'd stumbled upon one of its darkest. In the aftermath, I returned to my cabin, trying to process everything. The forest, once a place of solace, now felt alien, 
and threatening. But I couldn't let fear control me. I'd survived, and that was enough. As I sat by the fire that night, I couldn't help but think about David and the others who hadn't made it. Their fate was a grim reminder of the dangers that lurk in the wild. But for me, it was a call to keep going, to face whatever came my way. Life goes on, and so does the hunt. The pine forest outside of Talkeetna had always been my refuge. As a hunter, it was my playground, my sanctuary, a place where the worries of the world fell away, leaving only the primal challenge of man against nature. Today was no different. I'd taken the day off to head out into the woods, eager to bag a buck or two. My name's Gage, by the way, and I've been hunting these woods since I was a kid, taught by my father, who was taught by his. It was early morning, the air still holding onto the chill of the night. I parked my old Ford at the edge of the forest, strapped on my gear, and set off along a familiar trail. The crunch of leaves underfoot and the distant calls of birds were the soundtrack to my solitude. This was what I lived for. After an hour of trekking, I found a good spot to set up. I nestled into a small clearing, camouflaged by the dense foliage around me. The morning sun began to filter through the trees, casting long shadows and warming the earth. I was ready for a long wait, the kind that hunters know all too well. Patience was key. Around mid-morning, I heard a rustling in the bushes about fifty yards to my left. I raised my rifle, peering through the scope. A deer emerged, a beautiful six-point buck. I steadied my breath, finger on the trigger. Just as I was about to take the shot, the deer bolted. Frustrated, I scanned the area, trying to see what had spooked it. That's when I noticed the silence. The birds had stopped singing, and the usual hum of the forest was absent. It was as if the woods were holding their breath. I stayed put, listening, my senses on high alert. Minutes passed, and I heard it. A low, deep thud, almost like a heartbeat, but coming from the ground. It was faint, barely perceptible, but it was there. I dismissed it as some natural phenomenon, maybe an echo from a nearby stream or the shifting earth. I decided to move closer to where the deer had been, thinking I might still get a shot if I was careful. As I walked, the ground felt different, softer, almost spongy. It wasn't normal. I knelt down, pushing away the leaves and dirt, what I found underneath made my skin crawl. It was a patch of earth, unnaturally smooth and devoid of any vegetation, almost like a scar on the forest floor. In the center was a hole, perfectly round and about the size of a basketball. It was dark, impossibly so, like a void. I leaned closer, trying to see how deep it went, but I couldn't see the bottom. Suddenly a putrid smell hit me, like rotting meat mixed with sulfur. I gagged, stumbling back. As I did, I saw something move in the hole. At first, I thought it was an animal, but then it emerged, and I realized it was something else entirely. It was a hand, or what looked like one, but twisted and grotesque. The fingers were too long, the skin gray and mottled. It moved with a strange fluidity, almost like it was boneless. My instincts kicked in, and I aimed my rifle at the thing, but it was too late. It shot out of the hole with incredible speed, wrapping around my ankle and yanking me towards the void. I screamed, trying to kick it off, but its grip was like iron. Desperation fueled me, and I managed to reach my knife. I slashed at the appendage, and it recoiled with a screech that echoed through the trees. I scrambled to my feet, not daring to look back as I ran. I didn't stop until I reached my truck, my lungs burning and my heart pounding. I drove straight to town bursting into the sheriff's office, babbling about what I had seen. Sheriff Tomlinson, a grizzled man in his sixties who'd known me since I was a kid, listened patiently. Gage, you sure about this? He asked, his eyes narrowing. You didn't hit your head or something out there? I know what I saw, Sheriff, I insisted. There's something out there, something not right. Tomlinson sighed, scratching his head. All right, all right, let's go take a look. We drove back to the forest, and I led him to the clearing. 
The hole was still there, but the hand, or whatever it was, had vanished. The sheriff examined the area, poking the hole with a stick. Damn, he muttered. Never seen anything like this. We marked the spot and headed back to town. Tomlinson promised to look into it, but I could tell he was skeptical. The rest of the day passed in a blur. I couldn't shake the image of that hand, the way it had felt like it was pulling me into some abyss. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that hand, felt its grip. I decided I needed answers. I called up my buddy, Wyatt, who was an amateur cryptozoologist, a fancy word for someone who chased after legends and monsters. He loved this kind of stuff. Wyatt was all in when I told him about the hole. He showed up at my place the next morning, armed with all kinds of gear. Cameras, motion sensors, the works. We headed back to the forest, ready to find out what the hell was going on. We reached the clearing and set up camp nearby. Wyatt placed cameras around the perimeter, focused on the hole. We waited, watching the monitors, but nothing happened. Hours passed and the forest remained eerily silent. Just as we were about to pack it in, the ground began to throb again, that same rhythmic thudding. Wyatt's eyes lit up. This is it, he whispered. The hole started to widen, the earth around it collapsing inward. We backed up, watching in horror as something began to emerge. It wasn't just a hand this time. A creature pulled itself out, its body twisted and malformed, like something out of a nightmare. It had multiple limbs, all ending in those grotesque hands. Its skin was a sickly gray, covered in what looked like scars and burns. Its head was misshapen, with a mouth full of jagged teeth. It let out a screech, louder and more terrifying than before. Wyatt aimed his camera, but the creature lunged at him, knocking it out of his hands. I fired my rifle, but the bullet seemed to have little effect. The creature turned its attention to me, and I knew we were in deep trouble. We ran, the creature hot on our heels. It moved with unnatural speed, almost gliding over the ground. We could hear its guttural growls and the snapping of branches as it pursued us. I felt something sharp rake across my back, and I stumbled, the pain searing. Wyatt grabbed me, helping me to my feet. Come on, man, we can't stop! We burst into the clearing where our truck was parked, and Wyatt fumbled with the keys. The creature was right behind us, and I could see its distorted face in the rearview mirror as we sped away. We made it back to town, and I knew we had to go back to the sheriff. This time, we had proof. Wyatt's camera. The footage was shaky, but it clearly showed the creature. Tomlinson watched it, his face pale. Jesus, he muttered. What the hell is that thing? We need to warn people, I said. Whatever it is, it's dangerous. The sheriff nodded. I'll get a team together. We'll go back and deal with it. A group of us returned to the forest, armed and ready. We reached the clearing, but the hole had collapsed completely, the ground looking almost normal. There was no sign of the creature. Tomlinson ordered us to spread out and search the area. We scoured the forest, but there was nothing. No tracks, no signs of the creature. It was as if it had never been there. Wyatt and I stood at the edge of the clearing, staring at the spot where the hole had been. What do we do now? he asked. We wait, I said. It's still out there, we know that much. The sheriff's team continued to monitor the area, but the creature never reappeared. The forest gradually returned to normal, the birds singing and the underbrush rustling with life. A few weeks later, a hiker found a body in the forest, not far from the clearing. It was mangled, almost unrecognizable. The coroner couldn't determine the cause of death, but we knew. The creature had struck again. The town was on edge, and hunting season was suspended indefinitely. People were scared to go into the forest, and I couldn't blame them. Wyatt moved back to the city, saying he'd had enough of monsters. As for me, I stayed. This was my home, and I wasn't about to let some creature drive me away. The sheriff and I kept a close watch on the forest, patrolling regularly. We never saw the creature again, but we knew it was still out there, somewhere. The hole might have disappeared, but the memory of that day never would. In the end, life in Talkeetna returned to a semblance of normalcy. 
but we all knew that the forest held secrets, dark and ancient, waiting for the right moment to emerge. And when it did, we'd be ready. In the heart of the dense Pacific Northwest forests, where the trees seemed to stretch endlessly into the sky, I was tracking an elusive buck. My name's Clifford Brennan, and I've been hunting since I was old enough to hold a rifle. Today, however, felt different. I had just about every possible hardship thrown at me, but none of them had prepared me for what I was about to face. The forest was alive with the sounds of birds and the rustling of leaves. I moved carefully, stepping over roots and rocks, trying to make as little noise as possible. I had my Remington 700 with me, a trusty rifle that had seen many hunts. The buck's tracks were fresh, and I was sure I was getting closer. A sudden stillness fell over the forest. The birds stopped singing, and the usual background hum of the forest seemed to vanish. I paused, feeling a prickling sensation on the back of my neck. It was as if the forest itself was holding its breath. I pressed on, brushing off the unease. The tracks led me deeper into the forest, where the trees were thicker and the light barely penetrated. I glanced at my watch. It was just past noon, but the darkness made it feel much later. As I moved further, I noticed something odd. The tracks had changed. They were no longer the neat prints of a buck. They were deeper, wider, and there were more of them, like something heavy had been dragged through the forest. Curiosity got the better of me, and I followed the tracks. They led me to a small clearing, and what I saw made my blood run cold. The ground was disturbed, with patches of grass torn up and scattered around. In the center of the clearing was a large, bloody mess, what looked like the remains of a deer. But it wasn't just the sight of the carcass that unnerved me. It was the sheer violence of the scene. The deer had been mauled, its body torn apart as if by some monstrous force. I scanned the area, rifle at the ready. That's when I heard it. A low, guttural sound, almost like a growl, but not quite. It was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. I couldn't see the source of the noise, but I could feel it, a presence watching me from the shadows. My instincts screamed at me to leave, but my legs felt like lead. Slowly, I backed away from the clearing, keeping my eyes on the trees around me. The feeling of being watched grew stronger, and the forest seemed to close in around me. Suddenly, a movement to my left caught my eye. I spun around, raising my rifle, but there was nothing there. Just the dense underbrush and the towering trees. I took a deep breath and forced myself to move, to get away from whatever was out there. I retraced my steps, trying to stay as quiet as possible. The forest was eerily silent now, the oppressive silence only broken by my own breathing and the occasional snap of a twig underfoot. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being hunted. As I neared the edge of the forest, I heard the sound again, closer this time. It was a wet, slurping noise, followed by a low, rumbling growl. Panic surged through me, and I broke into a run. The forest blurred around me as I sprinted towards the safety of the open fields. I burst out of the trees, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't stop running until I reached my truck, parked at the edge of the forest. I threw myself inside, locking the doors behind me. My hands were shaking as I fumbled with the keys, finally getting the engine started. As I drove away, I glanced back at the forest. The trees loomed dark and menacing, and I could almost feel the eyes watching me from the shadows. I didn't know what was out there, but I knew I never wanted to encounter it again. When I got home, I called my friend Kurt. He was a retired forest ranger and knew these woods better than anyone. If anyone could make sense of what I'd seen, it was him. Kurt listened patiently as I recounted my experience, his face growing more serious with every word. Cliff, it sounds like you stumbled upon something you weren't supposed to, he said, his voice grave. There are stories about these woods, old legends about creatures that don't belong in our world. Most people dismiss them as folklore, but there are those who believe. I laughed nervously, trying to shake off the lingering fear. You think I saw a ghost, Kurt? 
He shook his head. Not a ghost. Something worse. Something ancient. The days passed, but I couldn't get the incident out of my mind. I found myself drawn back to the forest, despite the terror it held. I needed answers, even if I didn't want to admit it. A week later, armed with more supplies and a renewed determination, I ventured back into the forest. This time, I wasn't alone. Kurt had agreed to come with me, and he brought along his own rifle and a pack filled with survival gear. We retraced my steps, moving cautiously through the forest. The atmosphere was just as oppressive as before, but having Kurt with me gave me some comfort. As we approached the clearing, I felt the same prickling sensation on the back of my neck. The clearing was just as I remembered. The disturbed ground, the remains of the deer. Kurt examined the scene, his expression grim. This is bad, he muttered. Real bad. What do you think did this? I asked, keeping my voice low. I don't know, he admitted. But whatever it is, it's not something we can fight with bullets. We moved further into the forest, following the tracks. They led us to a cave, partially hidden by overgrown bushes. The entrance was dark, and a foul smell emanated from within. Kurt and I exchanged a glance. Are you sure about this? I asked. He nodded. If we're going to find answers, they're in there. We entered the cave, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. The smell grew stronger, almost overwhelming. The walls were covered in strange markings, symbols that looked ancient and unsettling. As we ventured deeper, the air grew colder. Our breath fogged in the flashlight beams, and the feeling of being watched intensified. We rounded a corner and came face to face with our worst nightmare. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, its body covered in matted fur. Its hands were clawed, and its face was a grotesque combination of human and beast. It stared at us with eyes that seemed to glow in the dark, a low rumble emanating from its chest. Before we could react, it lunged at us. Kurt fired his rifle, the shot echoing through the cave, but it didn't stop the creature. It swiped at him, knocking him to the ground. I fired my own rifle, but the bullets seemed to have little effect. In the chaos, I grabbed a nearby rock and hurled it at the creature. It hit the beast square in the head, and it staggered back, momentarily dazed. I took the opportunity to help Kurt to his feet, and we ran, not daring to look back. We emerged from the cave, gasping for breath. Kurt was injured, but alive. We made our way back to the truck as quickly as possible, the forest once again silent around us. As we drove away, I couldn't shake the image of the creature from my mind. Kurt broke the silence. We can't tell anyone about this, he said. No one will believe us. I nodded in agreement. What do we do now? We stay away from the forest, he replied, and we hope that thing never finds its way out. We never went back to the forest after that. The memory of what we saw still haunts me, but I try not to think about it too much. Life goes on, and I have to believe that some things are better left unknown. The forest remains, a dark and mysterious place, hiding secrets that are best left undisturbed. And somewhere within its depths, the creature lurks, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to wander into its domain.